what are you going to do with all your things when you do not have the strength or the interest in taking care of them anymore? You have many nice things. Have you thought about what you want to do with them after you're gone? Do you enjoy having all this stuff? Could life be easier and less tiring if we got rid of some of these things that you have collected over the years? Is there anything we can do together in a slow way so that there won't be too many things to handle later? Welcome to Spark Joy, the podcast dedicated to celebrating the KonMari method and the transformative power of surrounding yourself with joy and letting go of all the rest. With your hosts and certified KonMari consultants, Kristen Ivey and Karen Sochi. And now, here's the show. What is death cleaning and how does it compare to KonMari? On today's episode of Spark Joy, we'll get to the bottom of this mysterious decluttering trend by reviewing author Margarita Magnusson's book, The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning, How to Free Yourself and Your Family from a Lifetime of Clutter. We hinted in previous episodes that this was a topic that we wanted to explore further. Um, this idea of tidying across generations. We actually spoke with Lloyd Alter in episode seven about this. And we want to continue to explore this concept through the lens of this Swedish tidying model. But before we jump into the review, it's time for a joy check. Karen, what's sparking the most joy for you these days? Wow, this is a, a really good example of sometimes it's the little things that mean a lot. Um, just like a lot of people in New York City, we have very limited storage space, which in an ideal world would not make a difference because I am a Kanmari consultant, but it really does in some ways. So for example, there's just no way for us to keep Christmas ornaments or holiday ornaments in our apartment. So we have a storage locker. And in fact, we actually have two storage lockers. They go back a long way. Um, my husband had a storage locker where he kept a lot of his school paperwork and documents. And um, I had a storage locker. And so we have finally, after being married for four and a half years, getting around to combining the storage lockers, nice. which has been really interesting because we're, we're not only able to combine them both, but we're actually going to be able to end up with an even smaller storage locker because of the magic of Kanmari. However, it's been like trying to fit jigsaw pieces, jigsaw puzzle pieces together um, to try to make it work. But it's bringing me a lot of joy because I know not only am I kind of taking the next step in my KonMari practice by reducing the amount of storage locker space that I have, but it's actually going to reduce our storage costs quite a bit, of course. So that's what's sparking joy for me right now, getting that done. Nice. More money in your pocket. Yeah. That's always joyful. <laughs> so Kristen, what about you? Well, it's crazy to realize this, but I've actually been in Chicago for almost two years now. And I moved from Virginia to Chicago, but now I'm about to move again. <laughs> but I'm going to stay in Chicago. I'm just moving neighborhoods. So moving from Lakeview to Wicker Park. I'm super excited about it. I I love Lakeview, but it was definitely a neighborhood that I was told to live in so that I could figure out which neighborhood that I loved across the city, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So it was a good starter place. And now I've found a neighborhood that I think more suits my lifestyle. And I found a great apartment and I'm going to be saving about $365 a month too on rent. So I'm excited about that. Uh, it's great tip. It's not tidying tip, but life tip. Uh, move door, uh, in the winter if you're in a place where uh, it gets pretty cold um, anywhere other than like somewhere where there's a lot of skiing and things like that, where people want to, you know, take advantage of the wintertime activities. Here, the market's great in the winter. The property managers are willing to work with you uh, because nobody really wants to move in the winter. And it's going to be tough. But the great thing about the fact that I have kanmari my space is that moving is so simple. <laughs> it's so simple. Right, right. Um, it's still a challenge. I'm moving from a three a third story walk up to a third story walk up. No. Um, so my poor moving team, they're going to have a lot of work to do, but 
uh, in terms of like packing everything, it's going to be a breeze because I really just love everything in the space and don't mind taking it with me. So yeah, that sparks the the most joy right now. Just the fact that I was able to find a new place to set Studio Tidy up. Well, I have to say moving is never fun, but it's certainly a lot easier when you feel as though the things that you're moving are the things that you actually want to have in your life, which, you know, I think for a lot of people, they can't say that when they make a move. Uh, So this is really great. And not only that, but it's so exciting to hear about, you know, what you're doing as far as your finances, because that sounds like one of those things that's like really kind of a challenge right now, but the payoff is incredible. So. Yes, for sure. It's big focus this year uh, now that I don't have my home to worry about. Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, great. So now we've had our joy check. Let's talk about death. Yay! <laughs> uh, so, yeah, interesting topic today, but one we're not going to avoid. We're going to address it right head on, right? Yeah, that's, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> death is something that none of us can avoid. Yeah. Uh, at least at <laughs> one point. So instead of does it spark joy, today we're going to be focusing more on the question of, will anyone I know be happier if I save this? Mm-hmm. The first line of the book is, the only thing we know for sure is that we will all die one day. Yay, very positive. (laughs) It gives you a good idea of what's to come. Although the book is not as depressing as the title and the topic would suggest. When I first heard the term death cleaning, I have to admit I was a little bit confused and very turned off. (laughs) I, I just had so many questions. Was it some form of aggressive cleaning? Uh, Is it does it have something to do with a murder or a crime scene or something? Uh, is it about the afterlife or I was just so confused. So I took a minute to understand the term and read further. And essentially it's just another tool for you to use and keep in your self-development toolbox. And it's all about focusing on removing unnecessary things and making your home nice and orderly when you think the time is coming closer for you to leave the planet. So you'll have to excuse my Swedish, but in Sweden, this concept is called dostangning, which is a hybrid of the word for death and cleaning. And that basically means that death cleaning is all about going through all of your belongings and trying to decide how to get rid of things before someone else is forced to do it for you after you're gone. By death cleaning, when you're still healthy, decisions will be made with more thoughtfulness is kind of the general idea. As in, there's likely to be a large amount of things that that if you don't make plans to dispose of while you're still here, someone, most likely your grieving family, will have to make those decisions sometimes really quickly after you're gone. This may sound familiar, right? Spoiler alert, this process can be used in parallel with KonMari. In an interview with Cosmopolitan, Marie Kondo, she praised the book, um, The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning. She said, regardless of the motivation behind it, I think that tidying is an inherently valuable act. Reflecting on your life and re-examining what you value in life is an important process, no matter how old you are and where you are in life. So before we dive into a review of the book, it's it's really kind of interesting and important to understand where its author is coming from. Margarita Magnusson, Magnusson um, she's Swedish and she's between 80 and 100 years old. The book is not very specific about that, although that seems like a pretty broad range. Um, she's a former fashion and advertising designer with five children. She found herself doing a death cleaning process three times in her life after the death of her parents and the death of her uh, husband and then again with her uh, mother-in-law. Uh, following this, she began to take a look at her own belongings and began to downsize from a roomy home with a spacious garden to a two-bedroom, smaller place with a balcony. She's moved 17 times, so this book is kind of a commentary on that exercise, um, and it's really aimed at, at encouraging her generation, folks who are in that age range, um, to take a look at what they might do at this part in their at this time in their life, where they are preparing for the inevitability of their own passing. 
So let's lead with joy here. This is the first time we've done a book review on Spark Choice. This is exciting. And the book, again, is called The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning. So what we're going to do is just begin with what we really liked about the book. I would say, first, the book jumps right in to talking about death, a topic that most of us avoid. And we also avoid it when we're talking across generations as well. Mm -hmm. So Margareta proposes that we should not be afraid to talk about death. And if we are afraid, we should use death cleaning as a way to start that conversation. And here are some of the questions that she has given as examples for people to use when they're um, having these conversations. Oh, here they are. So what are you going to do with all your things when you do not have the strength or the interest in taking care of them anymore? You have many nice things. Have you thought about what you want to do with them after you're gone? Do you enjoy having all this stuff? Could life be easier and less tiring if we got rid of some of these things that you have collected over the years? Is there anything we can do together in a slow way so that there won't be too many things to handle later? Margaret is all about the tough love, right? She doesn't uh, skip around the, the point here. Yeah. And she focuses on, you know, really getting people to a point where they're not leaving this task of sorting through items and figuring out what's valuable or what matters to whoever these items are left to, like their loved ones or, or their spouse or their children. So she has this great quote. She says, do not ever imagine that anyone will wish or be able to schedule time off to take care of what you didn't bother to take care of yourself. No matter how much they love you, don't leave this burden on them. And I thought that was really blunt, but interesting right, <laughs> to explore. Right. I think that a lot of folks don't realize or don't want to think about until they are in a position where they're managing this process for someone who's passed on that, that the reality is that for a lot of us, all of these things that we have acquired and love and care for and, um, you know, are concerned about in, in our lives, oftentimes a lot of these things are going to end up in, either a big dumpster in our driveway or in trash bags, because they're just not going to be as meaningful to anyone else as they are to us. Um, and so someone's going to have to manage those things. And I think that that's really kind of what the book is, is trying to, to talk about as far as trying to avoid that unpleasantness. Um, she says another quote that's super, super good is that by talking about these things um, and asking these questions and having these conversations, um, this prevents, quote, a missed opportunity for different generations to know each other better. For sure. And it's not naturally built into our culture to really talk about death, kind of right. like it's not naturally built in to talk about finances. Like there's some kind of wall that we put up where it's viewed as taboo or not appropriate um, to ask someone what they're going to do after they're gone. So I like that this book head on is, is addressing the topic and, you know, uh, really bridging that gap. Well, yeah, there's this idea that if, I mean, even if you are the person bringing it up about your own things, like, you know, I just, you know, I, this, this is what I would like to have happen um, as I'm preparing for, you know, what might happen in the future. And your family is likely to say, oh, don't talk like that. Don't say those things. Sure. Um, then they really just don't even want to hear about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And they mean well. It's not certainly it comes from a place of love, but it really does kind of prevent people from managing those things before before, you know, somebody else has to manage it for them. For sure. Yeah. Well, the second thing we really liked about the book was that like the Kunmari process, Margareta explains how this process is meant to be executed as a one-time event that results in lasting change. So Margaret explains the difference between death cleaning and just a big cleanup is the amount of time they consume. Death cleaning is not about dusting or mopping. It's all about a permanent form of organization that makes your everyday life run more smoothly. And she suggests 
that you start at an earlier age, like 65 is the age of, that she mentioned, so that it won't seem like such a huge task. But there's, but there's really no right time to do this. You could start at any age, really. Um, you could do this even, you know, when you're much younger. It, it's really more of a process of thinking about what you have now and what you want to have happen to the things you have now, as opposed to thinking it's only something to do at the very, very end of your life. Exactly. And I think that's why it marries so well with Kamari. Kamari is more about looking towards the future and Mm -hmm. your vision and growing your life. And and then death cleaning is more like how you want to wrap up your life in a way and prepare it for your passing. So the third item that we really liked about this book is that you essentially get to choose the order that you address certain clutter categories, according to Margareta. And, you know, this, this may be a bit of departure um, from Kunmari, right? Because Marie Kondo intentionally says that you should walk through um, the clutter category in a certain order and has reasons why, there should be in a certain order. But I like that um, Margareta inserts this flexibility. Right. She she agrees with Marie. She says that you should not start with photographs or letters or personal papers, you know, all those sentimental things. Um, she suggests, like Marie, that you start with uh, death cleaning your clothing. But then after that, you should choose a category that you believe is the easiest for you to handle. So it's kind of the same idea of going from easier to harder, but she just doesn't prescribe, you know, a very specific order uh, to go in. She leaves a lot of that up to the person doing it. Exactly. And just as a reminder, the Kanmari clutter categories include clothing, books, paper, miscellaneous, and sentimental items. So I can give you an example of how maybe some things could be shifted around if they're not working for you. So I had a client who came to me and was like, you know, I have a paper problem. She didn't want to talk about anything but her office and her paper. And she just went on and on about how horrible her paper situation was. But I encouraged her to really look at this holistically in terms of walking through the categories in an intentional order. So when we, we, when we got closer to working, we, we finished up her clothing, we finished up her uh, books, we got closer to working through paper, she was experiencing a lot of anxiety. And I realized that paper was almost the equivalent of something that's sentimental for her, like something that would be really mm-hmm. challenging to attack. So we needed to move it closer to that category and focus on some miscellaneous things to warm her up to being prepared to uh, working through paper. So sometimes you just have to make a judgment call. Mm-hmm. These are all just models. And if you tweak them a little bit, they're not going to crumble. <laughs> so um, so yeah, even when you're you're working through you, through the intentional Marie Kondo order, just consider that you can switch it around based on what you believe is easy or hard. Right. Well, and certainly when it comes to kimono, that's a very easy thing to do because you know a lot of times, although we might start with the kitchen kimono, it, it for me it's really taking a look at what's causing the most anxiety and pain mm-hmm. for that person. So, I mean, it's, you know, everything is, it's a, it's a model. Just as you said, it's really, there's no, there's no definite way that this works. It, everyone's a little different in how they choose to handle it. Yeah. So I completely agree. So now we've talked about the parts of the book that we liked and it sparked the most joy for us. Let's tackle the parts of the book that left us wanting more that we found a little challenging. The main thing was that there's really no vision discussion. So in um, Kanmai, vision is pretty much everything. We ground all of our decision-making in our vision for um, our best life, what what we would like to see in the future um, for ourselves. And that helps us make decisions about what, what should be in our lives and what we are ready to let go of. And in the book... There's this idea that is, would, will anyone I know be happier if I save this? So it's a kind of a weird version of a vision. It's really about what you imagine someone in your life um, will care about and what will be important to them once you're gone. 
Um, but it's not really the same. It's just kind of a, it's just kind of a different way of looking at uh, what you're keeping and what you're letting go of. Exactly. And to be fair, death cleaning evokes a different perspective on the trajectory of your life. It's more about preparing for when you're gone and aligning yourself with that vision of how your family is going to react to that and your loved ones, um, rather than trying to build up to uh, the p- peak uh, moments and success in your life by planning, you know, a Kanmari like a uh, vision for of your ideal lifestyle. Mm-hmm. We wanted a little bit more structure of how to really implement the process and more guidance around how to be really intentional about the decisions you're making around the things in your home. You know, it's interesting because I think that this idea of us asking how we believe other people will feel about some of the objects that we're trying to decide whether we keep them or not. Because when I think of the things that I've, that I ended up with when my grandparents passed away, for example, they weren't like the really valuable things. They were like the little knickknacky things that I would, was just felt really familiar with. So Mm -hmm. like, for example, you know, the little, a little copper ashtray container thing that my grandmother had forever. That was kind of the thing that I most identified with her. And it was a thing that I wanted to keep. And although it's not at all valuable. So, and I don't think my grandmother would have had any idea that that would be something that I would have felt, you know, attached to. Sure. So it's really interesting, this idea of trying to figure out what other people will want. Exactly. Yeah. So there's also this idea that there's um, an emphasis on the getting rid of aspect instead of the joy. And while Margarita shares a lot of personal stories about her relationship with her husband and her mother and her children, death cleaning itself, it really emphasizes more the discarding part. Yeah, the rules for determining how much to keep are are vague and There are some statements like if you can't keep track of your things, you know, you have too many. So again, it's a focus on the number of things. Um, And we, we thought maybe for our audience, this wouldn't be specific enough to help you start to understand when your death cleaning event has started or ended. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was interesting because we got a question from a Spark Joy listener that really can help us kind of further explain this part of the book that left us wanting more. So I'll read the message from Amanda. She says, hello, my name is Amanda, and currently I've been having a hard time with two tasks, cleaning my room and cleaning the kitchen table. Every time I wash clothes, I dread folding them, so they end up on my bed for weeks, and the kitchen table is packed with mail and clothes. I've taken off after work, what can I do to motivate myself to fold clothes and read through mail? So what do you think about that one, Karen? Wow. So (laughs) this is a great comment. And I think there's probably something that a lot of people um, grapple with. It's, it's, um, it's really the act of upkeep to me. So when, when Amanda is talking about the clothing and, and having a large pile of clothing to fold, I think that it's the amount that's probably more overwhelming than the actual act of folding. If probably there were only a few things that needed to be folded, then um, then maybe it wouldn't feel so mon- monumental. Maybe it would actually even be something that you're looking forward to. The same with mail. If um, if you have if you see a pile that's a foot high to sort through, then all of a sudden there's no pleasure in that. There's no joy in that at all. So I think in this case, we're really talking about a quantity of items. I know that sometimes when I don't have time to get the laundry done, I'm waiting until, you know, I've I've, I'm down to my last pair of socks. And so that's the bad thing because that means that I'm going to have a lot of clothes to fold and it is going to feel more like a task. If I am more proactive in taking care of that, or if I'm dealing with a smaller quantity that I'm taking, that I'm maintaining a little bit at a time, then the task is not so enormous. So there's this kind of a maintenance thing that's also centered around the quantity. If I only have um, four t-shirts 
Then I'm washing clothes every couple of days, a small load, and folding and putting away a small load. Then it's not an overwhelming task. So in some ways, that that I, this idea that that there is some exact amount that you should have is more embedded in what amount will bring you joy in not only owning them, but also taking care of them. Another great example is this idea of of having clothes that have to be ironed or dry cleaned. One of the things that I ask myself and I ask clients when they're talking about something that is really beautiful and that they love, but requires a lot of upkeep, are you willing to do the upkeep that is involved in taking care of this? Are you okay with ironing it? Um, for a lot of people, they may love something, but they, they don't feel that that ironing is going to bring them joy. So that is kind of a quantity thing. I, I don't want a bunch of things that I have to iron because I know that I'm not going to want to, want to take care of them. So in Kanmai, there's a little bit more, there's more of a specific idea of what amount is, is going to spark joy for you. And that's really always gets back to that question. Exactly. And the question in this case would be, what is the vision for your ideal lifestyle mm -hmm. and your ideal living, living environment? And it's all about marrying your life with your possessions and with the boundaries that your home presents you. Okay. So if something is off balance there, either you have too many possessions or not enough space in your opinion, or your lifestyle requires you to spend time doing you know, things other than folding, mm -hmm. then you have to figure out what the balance there. And really it's important to lean on that uh, because that will help you ground your decisions. Uh, so when you, you start to get overwhelmed by a category, you can go back to really examining, examining what's there mm -hmm. and going back, of course, to what the root question is, does it spark joy, but really breaking that down to like, what, what types of clothes do I like to keep? What fabrics do I like? Right. Um, what styles do I like? And that becomes your criteria and anything else that doesn't fit that criteria can go. And then the noise is gone and you'll only have things that you love and that you'll want to honor and you'll want to fold. Um, so then you can get you know, on top of it there and also evaluate your time too. Mm -hmm. um, usually when people say the statement, I can't seem to get X done or this X task is piling up. Um, that just means that maybe uh, you are spending too much time in another place in your life uh, that could be opened up a bit for some time to, you know, focus on these day-to-day -day tasks, folding, cleaning, tidying, et cetera. And just one more thing. I think that a lot of times um, we can make even a, a, um, a task that's not our favorite thing more joyful by by making sure the environment and the time that you're doing it are times when you're going to feel more relaxed and more more serene about something. So for example, folding clothes, I always listen to music or I listen to a podcast. I, I'm always too. <laughs> trying to bring something like positive into, um, into that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I try really hard to not ever fold clothes late at night when I'm tired. Um, if at all possible, I try to do them in the morning or save them for like the early part of the day on a weekend um, because I just feel better. You know, it, it, there's nothing worse than feeling tired and feeling like you've got to get through something, whether it's folding clothes or washing clothes or, or anything. It's, it's not good to do it when you're really tired. So maybe that's a com maybe a combination of taking a look at how many, um, what what tasks are involved in caring for those items, and then how you're what you're doing in your environment to make those those tasks a little more pleasurable. Maybe all those things combined are part of the answer there. Exactly. And of course, you can use the death cleaning tip. If you can't keep, keep track of it or you're losing track of it, it's getting out of bounds, then you have too much. But really, we like to shift the discussion to what do you have, you know, and taking a closer examination of that and making sure you have um, things that matter and that bring you joy. Right. So thanks so much, Amanda, for submitting this great question. And we really want to hear uh, how things go from here. So please let us know on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter about your progress. And hopefully you'll have a better time managing your clothing as well as your papers moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. 
So the other thing that we notice about the book is that it encourages you to take your time. So death cleaning is supposed to be done at a pace that suits you. Yes. So that definitely is a stark contrast from Kanmari's quote, which is, if you tidy a little bit here and there and a little bit here and there, you will be tidying forever. There, I feel like there needs to be a more of a sense of urgency here Mm -hmm. uh, than you take your time. Of course, you have to do things at your own pace, but Sometimes when we do things at a slow pace, they seem to drop down in terms of priority. And if death cleaning is a priority, I feel like you should make time to really uh, complete it properly and efficiently. And and also you have that 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 clock ticking as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know it it talks a lot about how time is running out a bit um, for you. So it's not something that you should delay or let drag on. Right. So that's how we feel about, you know, the pros and the cons of this book. Uh, It was, it was in general, you know, it did did leave us with some practical tips. Mm -hmm. Uh, One being to leave messages attached to the items with instructions as to what should be done with them after you pass away, which is very interesting. So little notes or stickers or things like that on your things with directions on where they should go or who they should go to. And there was also a tip about giving things away before you go. So in, if you're going over your daughter's house, instead of bringing a bottle of wine, you would bring your like your, some kind of valuable that you mm-hmm. think that she might want. Um, so that was a very interesting tip too. Yeah. And one of the things that I thought when I first read this, I I had this big red flag go up because um, in in my line of work, my previous line of work, I know that if we had a patient who started giving away their things to family or to friends, mm-hmm. that, that could be a concern. Like maybe this person was feeling really depressed and sure. hopeless or something that was, a, you know, something to be noted and addressed. So I certainly can see the the validity of of letting go of some of these things, especially more valuable things, um, as you go instead of making it a one big thing at the end. Um but um it's definitely something you want to make sure that your family knows it's just not because you've you've begun to feel depressed and hopeless. So it's kind of an interesting um um suggestion. Definitely practical, definitely something that would be useful, but also something that you you want to make sure that your family doesn't become concerned. For sure. And yeah. maybe even communicating to your family members that you are death cleaning and, and truly explaining what that means. Because uh, again, that just the term itself is a little bit scary. I mean, someone doesn't really know what it means. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, mm-hmm. even having read the book and knowing that this book is, you know, garnered a lot of publicity. If somebody in my family came up to me and said, well, I'm going to start death cleaning. Right. I don't know. I mean, it would just be really kind of like, oh, this is not good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. So another practical tip, which was kind of actually very amusing in a way, is that you sh- don't save things or give away things that will shock or upset your family after you're gone. Um, so there's all kinds of things you can think of that maybe you wouldn't want your family um, to, to get or to see after you're gone. I guess, um, the, the funniest one that most of us can think of right off the top of our, of our heads would be, we wouldn't want any of anyone in our family to see our browser history. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so, yeah, There needs to be some app that will, um, like, uh, it, once we pass away, our browser history will like self-destruct. Or something. <laughs> um, That's a good one. And to tie in with that, Margareta, she suggests that you have a throwaway box. So this box would be filled with little things that are just valuable to you alone. Right. And you're, you would basically write throwaway when I'm dead on the box <laughs> and <laughs> you, your family members would not need to even look inside. It's just like a private box that just could be discarded. So that's another alternative or a place where you could keep things that you might think would offend a family member or, right. or whatnot. But you also have to trust the family member wouldn't look anyways um, and be (laughs) nosy, but so it's still a bit of a risk, but you know, it's, it's up to you. 
Yeah. Sometimes I feel that way when I look at things that I wrote when I was like 13 and 14. Sure. It's like, oh, please, God, let no one else ever see this. <laughs> <laughs> and in a few years, I may look at things that I've written now and feel the same way. Right. Um, one other thing is that when you're going through photographs, uh, which for most folks is going to be a huge category, mm-hmm. and you're trying to decide what photographs might be important or um, valuable to the people that you're leaving behind, keep in mind that if you don't know the people in the photographs or you don't know the names of the people in the photographs, it's very likely that no one else in your family will either. So those are probably safe to let go of. Um the other thing that is is a really useful practical tip is make sure that all of your passwords are kept somewhere that your family can um, get to. Uh, of course, this definitely would apply to things like financial accounts and um, all of those things that, 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 your, that your family members will need to be able to get to. But also, you know, just your social media accounts so that they can let family and friends know that, you know, that you've passed on or whatever, whatever the circumstance may be, you don't want people having to hunt around for those things mm-hmm. after you're gone. Yeah. Yeah. I think that really applies, especially to millennials and mm-hmm. we're moving towards like this completely almost digital way of operating. It's it's really important. Those passwords are key. So um, yeah, that's a great tip from, from death cleaning. So to review, we loved how this death cleaning book tackles a topic that is often avoided or viewed as sad or morbid. Uh, The questions that help, you know, those conversations to occur across generations. We love that uh, aspect of the book and that um, we shared. And while Margareta's experience and stories were often really relatable, we wish that the resources that she provided would be a little bit more practical. So practical tips or some structure around executing a a death cleaning um, and more focus on really the joy of the process than the act of discarding and getting rid of things. But in general, this book was great and it sparked discussion that you could now have with your parents, your grandparents, children, grandchildren and encourages us all to be really more transparent and to leave this earth in a way that doesn't place any burdens on our loved ones. And of course, sparks joy. Mm -hmm. So now we want to hear from you. Tell us your burning tidying questions or share stories about how Kamari has impacted your life. You can find us at sparkjoypodcast.com and click Ask Spark Joy to leave a question or comment for a chance to be featured on next week's show. While you're there, sign up to join our Spark Joy podcast community and get notified when each episode airs. You can also join the Spark Joy podcast community on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at the handle at Spark Joy Podcast. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope your day sparks joy. Thank you for listening to Spark Joy with your host, Kristen Ivey of For the Love of Tidy in Chicago and Karen Sochi of The Serene Home in New York City. Spark Joy, the podcast is not endorsed by or affiliated with KonMari Media Incorporated. The opinions expressed on this episode represent the views of the co-hosts and guests alone and do not represent the corporate position of KonMari Media Incorporated or the KonMari Consultant Community.